Amen. Church family, you can go ahead and have a seat. To those of you joining us on live stream, glad you are with us. My name is Rob. I'm the lead pastor here at Sam Alliance. And I'm joined on stage by Steve Fowler, a familiar face around here. Welcome, Steve. Steve is here in his, in his new role representing our district, the Alliance Northwest. I'm also joined on stage by Paul and Linda Myers. And today we get to celebrate and just do something kind of fun. Linda, our executive pastor, has completed all of her requirements for ordination and consecration. And today we get to set her apart for ministry. And we are going to celebrate that today. And I've asked Steve if you could just share a little bit about what that means and lead us in a charge. Yeah, it's kind of fun to be here in a moment like this and to celebrate uh, Linda's ordination consecration, which really are two words that you don't use in everyday conversation. Um, so it's really important to know what we're talking about. And when it comes to ordination and consecration, if you can remember just kind of three words, uh, first is just assignment that uh, people who feel a, a sense of calling to a vocational ministry, we're all called, we're all in ministry, but some are called into vocational ministry. And so Linda had a calling and an assignment that was given by God. And, uh, and following uh, an assignment is uh, an authorization that's, that's given by the Spirit of Jesus. This uh, authorization uh, contains with it spiritual authority. It's a positional authority that comes from being an executive pastor at a church like this. It's also, it's a spiritual authority that is given by Jesus himself to accomplish the task as you not only do things in the natural realm, but you impact what's happening in the unseen world in the supernatural realm. And then the last part of this, you get assignment and then you've got your authorization. The last part is affirmation. And that's the part we're celebrating this morning that this affirmation process is what leads to what we say someone is set apart, they're ordained and consecrated. And in our movement, the Christian Ministry Alliance, and in this church, this body of believers, that's a pretty thorough process. And the reason that is, is because not everyone who says that they are called um, are actually called of God. And so we need to test and approve as we lay hands on people and say, this is someone that we see called, assigned by God, authorized by God, to do the very work of God in our midst. And uh, so Linda has gone through that process. It involves uh, reading of books, writing of papers, um, being interviewed, and Paul has also participated in that process. I don't think he wrote any of Linda's papers, but uh, he was there for the interview. And it's a pretty significant interview. It's an all day thing uh, that took place up in where, where my office is, which is kind of, kind of fun. Uh, that you guys were up there. And uh, Linda, I just want you to know, Linda not only just passed the test, she just aced the test. She just really did so excellently, and people were so impressed by the quality and the character and just the, the, the nature of her calling um, and all the circumstances therein. So um, it is my privilege, Linda, as, uh, as someone who works in our district to just celebrate with you uh, this moment. You're set apart, ordained and consecrated to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, each of the services, I've been just trying to drop a word for you. And last night it was that you're a branch, he's the vine. Don't forget that. Last service it was let the words of Christ dwell in, dwell in you richly to the point that actually influences you and how you live. It isn't just about acquisition of knowledge. And in this service, I want to take you to Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, where, um, where God says, it's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Real quick, not by might, it's not by your personal talents, your personal strengths and skills, while you have many. Um, and then not by, uh, not by might, not by power. It's, it's not by the, the aggregate multiplicity of those around you who can just push hard and get it done. It literally is another word for army. Singular, plural, it's not by singular strength, it's not by plurality of strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So I charge you to remember, I know you know this, um, and you've embodied this so well over the years, but I know you know this, but I just, I encourage you and I exhort you to drink deep of the Spirit. Breakthrough doesn't happen with you. Breakthrough doesn't happen with a multiplicity of people gathered around you. Breakthrough happens when God pours out His Spirit. He's the only one who can do that. I know I'm preaching to the choir with you on this one, but... As you're an ordained person walking forward in your calling, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And that's Rob just to pray over that, that over you. He's <laughs> anointing you in that today. Yep. 
And so this morning, I'd love to invite any of our elders, governing board, pastoral management team that are present. If you could come join us for the laying on of hands. And church family, I'd invite you to play a role in this as well. If you feel comfortable in extending your hands as we affirm this calling on Linda's life, we'll be anointing her with oil. But this is a celebration today. And so, Linda, today we have the opportunity to anoint you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we set you apart for ministry. We declare that this is good. We affirm this. We see the authority on you. We see the Holy Spirit dwells in you and upon you. We anoint your hands for healing, and we just thank the Lord for who you are. As I was praying for you, I just saw this picture of an accelerator on a car, and you're part of that. That I just bless you with wisdom as you just discern when we push down, when we let off. You're also the governor that tells us you can't go faster than this. And so I just pray that you will be filled with new levels of wisdom as you lead us. I bless you. I protect you and your family. I thank you for Paul and your children. And Lord, we just celebrate today, Linda, and your calling and her obedience. May it be worship to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Church family, would you celebrate this with us? These are some of the fun things that we get to do. There's been a lot of fun things happening around this place the last couple of days. Yesterday, Feed Salem had an incredible time. We had quite a multitude of people that came over to our building, and uh, just God was doing some things there. Our lines for prayer were longer than our lines for food. In fact, we had somebody say, I came, yeah, I could use some food, but honestly, I came for prayer. We had a couple of people put their faith in Jesus. We'll talk about that with roses more next week. But we're just excited about some of the things. Every Tuesday and Thursday, there's 45 women and all these kids that get off these buses from different nations that come to learn English with us in our Baraka English program. And there's just, there's just activity around this place. And it feels like oftentimes on these Sunday mornings, we're experiencing Holy Spirit manifest presence in a fresh way. And I just want to thank you as a church for leaning into these things, for being generous with your time, for being generous with your giving. Some of you that have been showing up and praying through our sanctuary and on our campus. And that generous, the generous just giving of tithes and offerings, I also just want to pause and say thank you for that. And some of you have looked to engage in new ways. There's multiple ways you can do that around here at Sam Alliance. But your giving allows things like Baraka English and Feed Salem to happen. And you can give in person. There's boxes in the lobby. You can mail checks and you can give online. Most of you know this. But if you're new here, can I just encourage you, if you feel and sense God at work and you want to join us in this way, would you do that? Uh, we would greatly appreciate it as we just seek to see our city become a city at peace with God. Would you do me a favor before I give you, I got a tough first word right here for you. I just uh, take a really deep breath. Breathe that in. Okay, here's the deal. I just need you to understand that tax day is less than a month away. (laughs) April 15th, actually 17th this year is really, really close. And you just need to understand that some of you need to get on it. Some of you have been procrastinating, and we're just going to talk about this a little bit today. I know for me, I am so blessed. My brother's a CPA, and so he's just like, you send me your stuff. I got you covered. Got you covered. And so every year I get to do that. And even just me having to get everything together, like stress arises in me. Because I forget the passwords to like all these websites that I visit one time a year to print off the 1099. And it's just like, it rises up. And I know, so for the CPAs in the room, you know, today is for you. Today is for you. We're talking about taxes, and and that's the deal. And taxes are like, people just, they're never popular. No one likes to talk about taxes. No one likes to deal with taxes. In fact, taxes create revolts. Our country was founded on a revolution because of tax on tea. I mean, like, you know, they they get on the ships in Boston Harbor, and they just start throwing the tea in, and our nation is born. You know, taxes are an intense thing. And the same was true in the days when Jesus walked the earth. In fact, then, taxes were even a bigger deal than they are now, because Jesus lived in a time where the first century Palestinian was under oppression. The Roman Empire had come in, and every time you paid taxes, it was a reminder that you were an oppressed people. And so there 
there was this difficulty there, and they were talking about it all the time. There was controversies on should you pay these taxes or not. And Jesus comes into this. In fact, when Jesus was young, he undoubtedly heard stories of just these different revolts that were starting to happen because people didn't want to pay these taxes anymore. In fact, there was a huge one that happened not far from his town of Nazareth, actually over in Galilee. There was this guy named Judas, not the disciple that later betrayed Judas, uh, betrayed Jesus, but another man named Judas that actually started a pretty large-scale revolution because of taxes. And he started to get this thing going, and many people jumped on board, and they thought this could be our freedom from the oppression, the freedom from these taxes. And Rome came in and shut it down pretty hardcore. In fact, they crucified him and many of his followers, and they'd put these crosses on the roads that led out of the city and out of the villages as a reminder of you are a people under oppression. And they actually raised the taxes. And so the Palestinians of the day were paying more taxes than even other occupied areas, and taxes were a big deal. And here today in our narrative, we're going to see that Jesus is close to his crucifixion. He's getting towards the end of his days of ministry And we're talking about our unexpected king, but it's important to understand that Jesus and many of his followers, they are viewed by people as being part of a political uprising that's going to start a revolution, that's going to end the occupation, that's going to end the taxes. Might this figure be the next Judas, but a Judas that actually succeeds and frees us? See, the context here is important. Today we're in Matthew chapter 22, and we're looking at this as we march through these different narratives and head towards Easter. Matthew 22, we're looking at this story where Jesus is asked about taxes. If you want to read along in your pew Bible there in front of you, this is found on page 820. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, Matthew 22, verses 15 to 22. Then the Pharisees met together to plot how to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. They sent some of their disciples, along with the supporters of Herod, to meet with him. Teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. You teach the way of God truthfully. You are impartial and you don't play favorites. Now tell us what you think about this. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus knew their evil motives. You hypocrites, he said. Why are you trying to trap me? Here, show me the coin used for the tax. When they handed him a Roman coin, he asked, whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Well, then, he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. His reply amazed them, and they went away. This is the word of the Lord. Here in this kind of short little passage, I believe that there's one big truth that you have for today. This is it. You need to pay your taxes. (laughs) Let's pray. We're done. (laughs) Right? No, actually, there is so much happening in this complex passage. And here Jesus is stepping into some serious complexity. Jesus here is going to utilize this entrapment that he's being kind of brought into to actually give us a teaching on what it means to be a citizen here on earth while also being part of another kingdom that he keeps talking about, this kingdom of heaven. There's a lot of background that we'll get to as we walk through this text. But throughout this, as as that comes alive, I hope you see not only the brilliance of the text, but just the richness and brilliance of Jesus and how he handles this situation. I believe there's some lessons here for us. Jesus here is reminding the people that they're more than oppressed citizens of Palestine. They are part of something bigger that is beginning to unfold, that Jesus has come to inaugurate. And they are dual citizens. That's where the unexpected comes in. Jesus is declaring to these people that you're not just citizens here of Palestine, that you're not just citizens of this occupied territory and under Roman rule. No, you're more than that. He keeps talking about this alternative kingdom, this kingdom of heaven. And so he's telling them there's an unexpected expected citizenship that awaits you. You are dual citizens in the here and the now. And this is an important concept for us because we too are dual citizens in the here and now. And the reality of what Jesus is talking about here has immense implications for you and for me and for us collectively as a church as we relate to our world and to our city. 
I mean, Scripture is kind of, it's an interesting thing. Jesus is saying that we are not of this world. The Apostle Paul is telling us that we're citizens of heaven and that we should eagerly await his return as Christ our Savior. But at the same time, throughout Scripture, we are told to take care of our city, to pray for it, to serve it, to see it flourish. Peter tells us that we're sojourners and exiles and that this is our temporary home. And yet you come to church and we tell you, look, our vision is a city at peace with God. It's not just about waiting for another city at peace with God. It's about engaging and caring for our city in the here and now. And we tell you, we want to equip you and call you to be the the peace and the presence and the power of Jesus to your spheres of influence wherever you go. And we continue to tell you that you have been created and there's great plans that await you that you get to discover because you are a masterpiece created in advance. And there's this tension that we see that, yes, we're sojourners awaiting something incredible, but we also have a responsibility in the here and now. And so what I want to go after this morning is just this question. How are we supposed to think and act as citizens in the kingdom of God while at the same time being citizens here in our earthly reality. How do we live in that tension? And so in the next, I don't know, 18 minutes, my goal is to just answer any question you have about this ever. I can't do that, but I do think that in this particular interaction with Jesus, there's a couple of very clear things that we can watch, that we can learn from and see how Jesus lives in this tension. As a contextual theologian, I just love this passage. I want to give you three takeaways from this text to help you live in that tension. And here's the first one. Are you with me? You ready? First one, the name of Jesus has unifying power. Don't forget this. The name of Jesus has unifying power. We have two united groups that want to get rid of Jesus, and they actually unite because Jesus is the uniting factor. Not in a good way. They unite because he's a threat. Let me explain what I mean, because without some historical context, you might miss this. We have the Pharisees, and you're pretty familiar with the Pharisees. The Pharisees are totally anti-occupation, anti-Rome. They want them out. They don't want to pay these taxes anymore. The Roman rulers have come in. They have made it complex. They've made it difficult. They're a threat to the way they live their life. They're a threat to the religious rituals, and they are taking away power from them. The Pharisees want the Romans gone. They are anti-Rome. They are way over here, and they represent represent the religious establishment of the day. They partner with a group called the Herodians, these people of Herod. Herod is the puppet king of this area for Caesar. He's the puppet king. And let me tell you, the Pharisees, not fans of this guy or his followers. His followers are benefiting off this occupation. They're the ones that in a way have sold out their Jewish brothers and sisters, okay? They've sold them out. They are living pretty well. They're enjoying the, the benefit of these higher taxes because it's bringing them comfort. It's bringing them security. These two groups hate each other. They are polar opposite. They are extremes and they don't like each other. And yet they unite to deal with Jesus. Because Jesus has a power to unite people. It's pretty unbelievable. He brings these two extreme political camps together that have villainized each other and can't stand each other. And while they unite for a common bad, there is a lesson here for us. You see, the power of being united in Jesus brings unusual bonds for us, or at least it should. And I believe this is important. I believe this is important because I believe that our society is moving towards greater polarization in so many different ways every day. Social media and money-making news organizations are all using these algorithms that push people to the extremes. Polarization is not a good thing. Here's the deal. Polarization does not promote peace. And church family, we are about peace. We are peacemakers Christians have a key role in the coming days. I truly believe this, that we are the antithesis of the extremes that we see manifesting in our society. These days, it feels that the only, one of the only safe places you can have civil dialogue with the, is with a brother and sister in Jesus who has some disagreements with you. And we need to lean into that, and we need to example to our culture what this looks like. Here we have a collective picture of Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot, these two disciples of Jesus who grew up in very different ways, who honestly have met each other without Jesus would rumble on the streets. They literally would probably kill each other. And here we find them under the banner of Jesus ministering peace to people together. 
Jesus has a unique way of drawing people together because his name is power and his banner flies over them. And church family, we need to re- recognize that it flies over us and we have an in- integral role, I would say a prophetic role to help hold our society together in these polar- polarizing days. Because we, the church, are peacemakers. We are the middle ground. We get to bring together and consistently reach out to people with differences and try to keep them at the table and allow them to have conversations. It's part of what it means to be a dual citizen because we are less about where we are and more about who we are. A people that come under the rule and the reign and the unity of Jesus. We're for that unity, not always fighting for the uniformity. And so church family, can I just encourage you, even in the coming weeks, to converse with people that you might disagree with. Be slow to cancel people, especially brothers and sisters in Jesus. Recognize common ground that you have in Jesus and learn from one another. May we example for the world what it looks like to push away from polarization and bring peace. This is such a tangible way that we move forward in our vision to see Salem be a city at peace with God. Second thing I see here, Jesus and his followers are difficult to put in a box. Jesus and his followers are difficult to put in a box. See, here we have these two opposing groups, and they unite to set a trap for Jesus. In many ways, they are saying, Jesus, anything you say or do will be used against you in a court of law. They want to see him arrested. They want to see him crucified. Their limited thinking says that if we trap him with this question, there are only two answers he can give. Their assumption with the questioning is that he will publicly be seen as a threat to Rome, so the Herodians will arrest him, or he will sell out Rome and side with the Pharisees, and therefore, or the opposite, but then the Pharisees will say he's lost religious respect. And so this crew that he's growing with will say, no, you're, you're pro-Rome, because you said pay taxes. See, they think they have him like, lose, lose. They think they've totally got him trapped. In my knee recovery, I had some times where I was pretty not mobile, still am, and one of the things I decided to do was learn how to play chess. My boys had started playing chess a little bit with this chess.com app, so I took it up, and one of the things that I learned is I'm really bad at chess. Like, I'm horrible. I even do the little lessons and stuff, and it's not helping. I continually lose. I've learned about myself that I'm a quick reactor, and if somebody steals a key piece of mine, I just immediately take the piece that stole my piece, which then puts me in a worse place because then they steal that one and two others. And I'm just like, dude, take a breath. Like, just relax. You don't have to react. You're never going to be good. The other thing that has happened to me as I'm playing chess is there's these times where just like confidence comes in and I set my trap for my opponent and I'm like, here we go, lose, lose for them. You're going to give me your queen or you're going to give me your bishop because one of them's coming my way. And all of a sudden it says checkmate on the screen and I'm like, <laughs> what the heck happened? I had you lose, lose. And honestly, it's like I'm one of these Pharisees. They think they've got Jesus. We got you down. There's nothing you can do. And yet Jesus diffuses the situation. He doesn't indict himself. In fact, he flips the trap. He calls out their hypocrisy, tells them how to live. And just as the word checkmate appears on my screen, Jesus is literally telling them checkmate. And scripture says they walk away amazed. They came to arrest him. And they walk away amazed. I think there's lessons here for us. These days, man, so many people are walking on eggshells with one another, trying to figure out where this person stands on this issue, which camp they are, how can I label that person? And here's the thing, dual citizens are tough to put in a box. That's a good word for some of you because you don't like being put in a box. You want to be a bit confusing to the world. But for some of you, you're pretty black and white thinkers. And that's a tough word to hear. But society is wanting you to come under certain labels and boxes. And Jesus is saying, no, come under my word. You come under my word. And I just see here that I think Jesus is reminding us that we don't need to be trapped by religion or society's labels. We don't always have to pick sides. Hear hear me clearly. There are times where we need to and we do and we will. 
But here in this passage, Jesus is reminding us to be wise and winsome in our responses to those that are trying to label or box us in. There are ways that we can respond with a a posture that leaves people amazed and leaves people thinking. But it means that we have to be strategic and full of grace and really trying not to cancel people or offend half of the society with our words. Jesus often does this by responding to a question with a question. You notice he does that here, and it's a pretty simple tactic when people are trying to box you in to respond to their question with a question because when we do that you will find that you actually can go to a deeper place as a pastor i'm often put in situations whether it be with people in this church or other churches or other pastors or just other friends that don't know jesus around the city or civic leaders where i feel like they're coming for me and they're wanting to box me in and see where i am in this because they want to argue or come at me or something and i've i've learned to kind of enjoy that and actually turn that into a, a challenge where you know what, I think God might have a word for them. And so I'm trying to respond to them with a question that goes deeper and actually looks at what is your underlying assumption and where is your devotion that is causing you to come at me in this way? And let's go deeper and let's have a civil conversation about this. And might God even be pursuing you through this trap that you're trying to lay for me? And church family, I believe we can do the same. I believe that God is going to use these encounters where we react in a way that we're not easily offendable, but actually show the love of God to people and don't get judgmental or defensive, but actually engage in dialogue and recognize that God might be wanting to do something in that person. Because we're dual citizens and we're peacemakers and we get to winsomely turn these traps into honest conversations about deeper things. The final thing I see here in this text is probably the most important one because it's not a suggestion on how to stay united or to dialogue with people that are trying to trap you. It's an identity issue. The final thing I see here is that Jesus and his followers value who they are over where they are. The heart of what Jesus is saying in this narrative is actually dealing with our identity. He's saying that as a dual citizen, you cannot forget that identifying with your city and your country, though important, are not as vital as your identity in Jesus. So much is happening in this interaction. And let's talk about this coin and the significance of even the coin. First, notice that Jesus asked the Pharisees for the coin. Hey, do you guys have a coin? Let me see the coin. This is like, bro, this is my favorite part of the passage. Because, see, that, that, that coin has an icon on it. The Pharisees shouldn't have that coin. The Pharisees have set up law that makes it kind of like breaking some of their own regulations to have possession of that coin. And Jesus just kind of like in a sly way is like, hey, do you guys have a coin? Let's talk about this. Here you go. Without saying anything, he says, you're hypocrites. Without saying anything, he moves it from a political discussion to a discussion about devotion. Dude, he's amazing in these things. I love, I love Jesus. Like, I, I love the way he interacts with these guys in this situation. But this coin is significant. Here's a picture of the coin. I'll put it up there for you. Both sides of the coin. On the one side, we see the head of Caesar with the Latin inscription, Caesar, son of the divine. On the other side, it reads, high priest. Do you see why it's an issue to have this coin? Here's the other thing. Caesar has power and money, and it stops there. He's ugly. (laughs) You're all thinking that right now. Let's be honest. The poor guy. I mean, he's endowed with power and money, but wow. Wow. I hope that's not accurate. Anyway, that's a side note. I just, I just, I I researched this and was, wow. But notice they're in possession of this coin. And Jesus is, is wanting to point out He's wanting to point out their hypocrisy, and he's wanting to show what is on that coin so that he can make a statement. You see, there's alternative currencies that the Pharisees have even had a role in setting up, that the Jewish people, the Israelites, they, they, they can use these cor- currencies so they don't have to just kind of be corrupted by carrying around this coin, a coin with an icon on it. But Jesus is calling out their hypocrisy. But he also, there's another subtle detail that we see here. Because the Pharisees ask him, is it okay for us to give to Caesar these taxes or not? And the word that is used there really means to give. It's a good translation. But Jesus changes the word that he uses for give when he responds to them. 
And our NLT doesn't pick this up well, but our NLT says, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. So Jesus' response, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. But Jesus uses a different word that doesn't necessarily mean give. It means give back or pay a debt. And so Jesus is saying, give back to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give back to God what belongs to God. Why is this important? Well, one, it tells us how to live under a government. Yes, give back. Yes, pay your taxes. Actually, pay your taxes and realize that you are being receiving some levels of protection and roads and security and resources. And so pay your taxes. But then what does it mean as far as what we offer in return to God? What does he want back? Here's what he wants back, your allegiance. He wants your allegiance. Because the coin of the day bore Caesar's image but humanity bears God's image. Let me say that again. The coin of the day bore Caesar's image, but humanity bears God's image. God's economy is totally different. He operates with a different currency. His value is those that have been created in his image. And every single person in this room, whether your allegiance is in him or not, you are created in his image and you bear his image. And what he is asking as a result of that is for your allegiance. That's what he's asking you to give back. He wants the whole of us because we are his sons and daughters. And so we are called to live as dual citizens in this tension. Who we are is more important. Our identity always trumps where we are. We are citizens of God's eternal kingdom. Yes, dual citizenship, it requires proper activism and engagement in our city and in our Willamette Valley and in our world, but ultimately what it requires is allegiance to King Jesus. We live in this tension. As we close, Jesus here is saying to us, you're a citizen of heaven, so live like it. Introduce the realities of heaven to your earthly reality influence, care, bring peace on earth as it is in heaven. There are many opinions within the church of what that should look like, what it means to live as a collective community, as a dual citizen. Many of you are new to this church in the last nine months, and let me just remind you, I, I need you to understand, you're part of a church that takes this serious, and we are a church that is for our city. We are not against our city. We are not afraid of our city. We do not think we are better than our city because we are simply part of our city and we are for our city. We want to see shalom. We want to see the peace of God manifest in our presence and therefore we embrace this tension of living as dual citizens. We look around and say we get to be salt and light. We get to engage and realize that it's about people. It's not about accumulating power or safety or comfort for ourselves. No, it is about how can we love others the best. We don't simply call out the problems and the issues in our city. No, we look to find solutions. And we even partner with people that disagree with us to, to carry out and implement a better way to live. We don't run from the dark corners of our city. We actually move in, we engage, and we invite in because we believe that we get to be the peace and the presence and the power of Jesus everywhere we step in the here, in the now. And we realize full well that things might not get better until Jesus comes back, but it doesn't matter because we bear his image and our allegiances to him. And this is what he's asking us to do in the here and now. And we do it with also remembering that there's a hope of heaven, that one day the new heaven and the new earth will be established and everything will be made right. It's what it means to live as a dual citizen in church family. We're called to live in that tension. Let's pray. Jesus, we declare that you are a good father. It blows our minds to think that all of us in this room, men and women, are created in your image. What a privilege. What a privilege to walk in the authority that was forfeited to the garden, but that you gave us back. You presented us with that authority to make things right, to see injustices in our city and deal with it, to set people free, to pray for healing, a pronounced blessing, and you've called us to, to be that. 
But we tell you it's difficult. There's this tension of living in the here and now as we await your return. And so we just pray that you would continue to reveal to us ways to do it well, that we would be a winsome people, Lord, that we would not be easily offended, but that we would remember that you are pursuing all people because you are good. So, Lord, as we continue to worship you, would you continue to remind us of our identity? And for anyone in the room, Lord, that is realizing that they're created in your image, but their allegiance is not to you, I pray that you would even stir them now. That you would stir them now. In Jesus' name, amen.